the past year, our lives have been totally transformed by the coronavirus pandemic. When this virus first burst upon the world, everything about it was uncertain. We didn't know what it was, how it spread, where it came from, how it wreaked such havoc upon the body or how to treat it. Science has dramatically increased our knowledge of all of these. It's also shown the wider world how scientists actually work. Science does not provide immutable theories. We construct a hypothesis, a story, if you like, about how the natural world works. But as we collect more data and our understanding evolves, so too does the story. Science must be constantly embracing uncertainty. It is truly the art of doubt. But coronavirus is not the only pandemic. There's also currently a silent pandemic of diabetes. It's estimated 450 million people worldwide had diabetes in 2015, and this is set to rise to over 600 million by 2040. In 2016, 5 million people died of diabetes. That's one person every six seconds. The high blood sugar in diabetes results in a number of complications including an increased risk of heart disease, kidney disease, blindness, nerve damage, and limb amputation. All of these can be reduced by good control of blood glucose, but that is not always easy to achieve. Diabetes is not only costly for the individual, it's also very expensive for the state, and the global cost of diabetes is estimated at over $850 billion a year. It also substantially increases the risk of symptoms, severe symptoms, for people infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So we urgently need to understand what causes diabetes and how to treat it. Diabetes is a metabolic disease that results from an insufficiency of the hormone insulin, which regulates your blood glucose level. It's very important that your blood glucose is kept within narrow limits. If it drops too low, for just a few uh, minutes, then your brain will be starved of fuel and you will die. But if it's too high for too long, you increase the risk of developing complications like those found in diabetes. In response to a rise in blood glucose, such as after a meal, insulin is released from the beta cells of the pancreatic islets and it stimulates the uptake of glucose into muscle, liver and fat, thereby restoring blood glucose to its resting level. Insulin is the only hormone capable of lowering the blood glucose, which explains why an insulin deficiency results in the chronic hyperglycemia that characterizes diabetes. In all cases, this is associated with impaired insulin secretion from the beta cells, but it can be exacerbated by impaired insulin action in the tissues, such as happens in obesity. In type one diabetes, Insulin secretion is reduced because the beta cells are destroyed by an autoimmune attack. In type 2 diabetes, which is the most common variety, the beta cells are present, but they fail to respond to glucose with insulin secretion. To understand what goes wrong in type 2 diabetes, we first need to understand how glucose normally stimulates insulin secretion. And that's what I decided to investigate when I first set up my own lab. At that time, it was known that glucose was taken up and broken down by the beta cell, that is metabolized, and this led to electrical activity, which in turn triggered uh, insulin secretion. What was unclear was what served as the link between glucose metabolism and changes in electrical activity. We discovered that the missing link was an iron channel, a potassium channel. Iron channels are proteins that are found in every cell of your body and every organism on earth. They act um, like little gated pores and they sit in the membrane that surrounds each and every one of your cells. When the pore is shut, ions can't go through and when the pore is open, ions like potassium can permeate. And because ions are charged, they carry a current and that causes electrical impulses. Of course, iron channels don't look like the cartoon on the left. They're actually far more beautiful. The atomic structure of the channel regulated by metabolism is shown on the right. 
It's made up of four KIR 6.2 subunits, which surround a central pore, and four regulatory sulfonylurea receptor or SUR1 subunits. These bind sulfonylurea drugs, of which more later. The channel we discovered is now known as the ATP sensitive potassium channel or KATP channel and it's so called because it's regulated by a breakdown product of glucose known as ATP. When blood glucose levels are low, glucose metabolism and ATP are also low and this keeps the KATP channels open and prevents electrical activity and insulin secretion. Conversely, when blood glucose levels rise, as on the right, glucose metabolism generates ATP, which binds to the KATP channel and causes it to shut, thereby triggering electrical activity and insulin secretion. The KATP channel is important because its impaired metabolic regulation results in diabetes. This can happen either because of mutations in the channel that render it insensitive to ATP, as in neonatal diabetes, or because impaired metabolism fails to generate sufficient ATP to close the channel, which is what we think happens in type 2 diabetes. So I'm first going to focus on neonatal diabetes, which is a very rare inherited disease characterized by marked hyperglycemia, high blood glucose, within the first six months of life. About 50% of cases are due to mutations in the KATP channel genes, KIA 6.2 and SUR1. And these were first identified by Professor Andrew Hattersley at Exeter University. And he and his team asked us to see if these mutations had a functional effect. And we found that all of them act by reducing the ability of ATP to shut the channel, which of course prevents insulin release and accounts for the diabetes of the patients. This discovery had implications for therapy it was originally assumed that neonatal diabetes patients had an unusually early onset form of type 1 diabetes. So it was thought they had no functional beta cells and they were treated by insulin injection. However, our work with the Hattersley group suggested this might not be the case and that the reason for the lack of insulin secretion was because their beta cells were essentially switched off and failed to close in response to glucose, as shown on the left. What we needed was a drug that could bypass the metabolic steps and close the channel directly, as shown on the right. And there was such a drug. Sulfonylurea drugs had been used for over 50 years to stimulate insulin secretion in type 2 diabetes, but had never been tested in neonatal diabetes. These act by closing the KATP channel, and happily we found that they also closed most of the mutant channels. Because sulfonylureas were in routine clinical use, it was possible to try them immediately in neonatal diabetes patients. This figure from the work of Sargon and colleagues shows that as the sulfonylurea dose, which is shown in red, is increased, so the insulin dose, shown in orange, can be reduced without an increase in the blood glucose concentration. In fact, the drug's much better at controlling the insulin level, I mean, the um, blood glucose level than insulin. More than 90% of neonatal diabetes patients have now transferred to drug therapy and both their clinical condition and their quality of life improve, which is of course immensely satisfying to all of us working in the field. However, neonatal diabetes is a very rare disease. The vast majority of patients have type two diabetes. So could it be that the KATP channel is also involved in this disease? And that's what our studies of neonatal diabetes suggest. Type 2 diabetes is a progressive disease that starts with impaired glucose tolerance and progresses to diabetes as the beta cells gradually fail. And by the time patients are diagnosed, they've already lost 50% of their beta cell function. So a key question is, why did the beta cells stop working? One possibility is that beta cell function is gradually impaired by the increasing blood glucose level. To investigate this, if this is the case, we engineered a mouse model of neonatal diabetes in which we can sw rapidly switch off insulin secretion, causing high blood glucose and diabetes within a couple of days. And what we found was that diabetes causes a massive loss of insulin content. On the left here, you see islets stained brown for insulin. 
The control light at, islet at the top shows very strong insulin staining, but after four weeks of diabetes shown below, this is markedly reduced. And the right-hand graphs give quantification of insulin content in the islet and the uh, beta cell and show it falls in diabetes. So to address the question of whether the reduction in insulin content was due to loss of beta cells or to the loss of insulin itself, we turn to electron microscopy. Controlled beta cells are full of insulin granules, whereas the diabetic beta cells shown on the right have many fewer. Thus, the loss of insulin content results from a decrease in the amount of insulin in each individual beta cell and not from beta cell death. You may be wondering what the empty spaces shown in the diabetic beta cells on the right are, and it turns out that this is glycogen, which is washed out of the cell using conventional um, fixation methods. And using methods that preserve glycogen, as shown here on the right, reveals extensive deposits of glycogen particles in most diabetic beta cells. Glycogen is produced from glucose, and it's not normally accumulated in beta cells. The massive increase in diabetic beta cells suggests that beta cell metabolism is impaired by chronic hyperglycemia, and we therefore explored if this was the case. But as you possibly know, metabolism is a network of incredibly complex pathways, so we had to use methods that enabled us to look at how diabetes changes the expression of all of the genes and all of the proteins in the beta cell. And one of the most important pathways affected was mitochondrial metabolism. Mitochondria are the power plants of the cell and they make lots of ATP. And mitochondrial ATP production is essential for insulin secretion. And if it's impaired, insulin re release is prevented. So we next looked at ATP production directly. And here you see the changes in ATP in islets isolated from control and four-week diabetic mice. And it's clear that increasing diabetes from 2 to 20 millimolar stimulates an increase in ATP in the control islets, but not in diabetes. So to summarise, I've shown you that chronically high blood glucose leads to a reduction in insulin content and strongly impairs beta cell metabolism. And what this means is that the KATP channel will fail to close when blood glucose levels rise and insulin secretion will be impaired, thus causing diabetes. I've also shown you that neonatal diabetes can be treated by sulfonylurea drugs. However, transfer to sulfonylureas happens far more readily in young patients who've had diabetes for less long. Type 2 diabetes can also be reversed in some patients by very low calorie diets. But again, this seems to be easier in people who have had diabetes for less long. So it seems that long term diabetes may cause irreversible changes in beta cell function. And thus it's important to find out how to slow diabetes progression. And our studies suggest that it's the chronically elevated blood glucose concentration that drives this progression. We suggest that a number of factors, such as a genetic predisposition, age, pregnancy, or insulin resistance caused by obesity, might call a, a small rise in blood glucose, producing mild glucose tolerance, mild glucose intolerance, sorry. The problem is that this causes gene changes that impair beta cell metabolism and reduce insulin secretion further. And this will exacerbate the hyperglycemia, raising blood glucose even more and producing a vicious cycle that underlies the progression to frank diabetes. Preventing this cycle may be of therapeutic value and that's what we're trying to do now. In conclusion, I hope I've convinced you that the KATP channel plays an essential role in insulin secretion and that its impaired regulation causes diabetes. This can happen either because of genetic mutations in the channel itself, which cause neonatal diabetes, or because of impaired glucose-stimulated ATP production, as we think happens in type 2 diabetes. Many brilliant young people have contributed to the studies I've talked about, and it's been a privilege to work with them. I thank them all. I also thank the funding bodies, our many wonderful collaborators, and the patients, their families, and their physicians. Finally, I hope I've also convinced you that science is a powerful means of embracing uncertainty, perhaps the most powerful one we have. 
and that it can help us understand the silent pandemics and how to treat them. Thank you.